Hello and welcome to Your True North, a space filled with authentic talks about personal stories, a space where you can connect, explore, and let yourself be in awe of the human spirit. I am Yulia Farkas, and I am your guide along the journey of discovering motivational, conventional, surprising, witty, or even persuasive personal stories. Do you happen to read what people post on social media and wonder where does it all come from? What is their story? But people don't come with subtitles now, do they? So what do you do then? You strike up a conversation and maybe you are lucky enough to hear the story of a powerful woman that came into her own after life's ups and downs, after exploring different avenues to figure out who she really is. She now helps business owners to release themselves and their business from the cage of shoulds, from labels, from self-doubt, and get excited about sharing their message on and offline. Please welcome Trisha Lewis, actor, author, communication coach, and how she likes to say it, an unsquasher. Welcome. Hello. Welcome, Hello, Trisha. Julia. Hello. <laughs> it's good to it's, have I, you. I, 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 it's a pleasure to be here. I'm trying not to say too much because <laughs> I'm, save, I'm saving myself. Yeah. Saving yourself. Okay. So I avidly read your LinkedIn post and uh, the, they are on the topic of being unsquashed. <laughs> you grew up in the 1950s household. What would a squashed day in your life be like in that particular point in time? Yes, um, yes. So I'm I'm, I'm very very old. Um, and <laughs> to be fair, I was born in 1957, so I didn't remember a lot of the 50s. But that 50s vibe went on through the 60s. You know, so it wasn't yeah. just the 50s. It was. It was very. It was very neat. Um, it was a bit like, uh, I don't know if the listeners will have heard of the Ladybird books, but they were very popular when I was little. Um, they had sort of lovely illustrations on one side and just a few simple words on the other. They were for kids to learn to read, but they were very much um, a sort of comfortable uh, a house with a garden um, and a mum and a dad and a girl and a boy <laughs> and the girl did girl things the boy did boy things the boy helped dad do you know chop the wood and the girl helped mum do the washing up but it was um i i relate shall we say to that story um except that i was more like an only child as well which might have made it even more sort of constricting in a way because my my brother was sent away to boarding school when he was just seven and he was four years older than me so I never really developed a relationship with my brother and it's the kind of weird thing that people did in those days thinking that it was for the good um so yes my mother had the apron on um and was i think rather bored and frustrated my father had the briefcase and um went off and probably had lots of fun <laughs> yeah so a, a bit very sort of routine you know you get up you do this you brush your teeth da 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 you go to school you come back teas on the table kind of thing um and I'm not saying that we didn't ever have any laughs. I remember some good laughs from time to time, but I also have a sense that um, there was this kind of unspoken uh, rule that you didn't just go too far. You didn't kind of show off too much. And probably the conversations weren't so deep either. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of deep, no. And I remember trying to do more of that as I was obviously getting into my teens and all the rest of it. And I didn't seem to get very far. It's funny because I'm sure they're both very intelligent people and I'm sure I could have had some great conversations, but it was almost as if we don't 
do that with our children. You know, that's sort of, um, yeah, that, that, that's for grown-ups, even when you are almost a grown-up. <laughs> so I do remember at school being part of the debating society and I loved it. So clearly it was in me to want to have those really deep conversations, yeah. Uh, and I know you told me that your father was a bit overbearing, let's say, and that uh, your mother didn't quite understand you or support your ideas fully at times. And I know that they had different plans for you, for your life, for your career. Did you beat yourself up for not meeting your family's expectations or <laughs> their ideas well, of life, <laughs> how life should it, be like? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a, did I? That's an interesting thing. Maybe the way I did beat myself up was not, oh, I should have done X, Y, Z, but more, oh, look what a disappointment I am because I didn't do X, Y, and Z. So I never regret not going down the path that was um, pre-made for me. Pre-ordained. <laughs> <laughs> Ordained, that's the word. I knew there was a word. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because that would have had me um, marrying a, 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 a rich guy and um, and probably becoming a, a, a bored and frustrated housewife with lots of kids while he went off to work. Oh, look, history repeating itself. So I'm I have absolutely um, quite a lot of pride in myself for um, constantly bashing back against those forces. But there is the other side of it, which you made me think of with that question, which is, yes, I did always feel like I was a disappointment. Because you didn't mm. play into their into their expectations. Mm. Mm. Yes, but you had the courage to step out of the line, you know, <laughs> out of that. And I mean, uh, people don't always ask themselves questions. And I think that this is why they they linger in uh, in places where they are not happy, where they are not in touch with themselves, when uh, they don't understand themselves. When did you first start asking questions about who you were, who you wanted to be, why you did things in a certain way, or why you did not do things well, in a certain way? That's yeah, it's um, another cracking question, Yulia. So I. I have a good I have a little story which which I think illustrates the the first moment that I, I can really put into concrete terms. So when I, I when I was at school, um I had quite an interesting school life actually, because I went from an all girls posh school to an all boys posh school <laughs> where they had taken six girls in to the sixth form for the first time. This was in 1973. And uh, it was a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. A, it was an experiment. Yeah, we were an experiment. Absolutely, we were. And um, <laughs> it's quite funny because I remember the head. To, I had to go and be sort of interviewed by the head, and I remember wearing my school uniform with my hair tied back in a ponytail. And I remember, I think the head teacher said something to my parents along the lines of, "We don't want anyone too um, too attractive or something," <laughs> which. I didn't totally, yeah, register at the time, but of course, a few weeks in, the ponytail was down, and you know, the clothes were were much more relaxed. So um, I think I think he didn't see through my ruse there. So, um, but anyway, that was an experience. Those two years in uh, sixth form, and I did focus on drama and art, and they had it was great there, but. My parents weren't over keen on the idea of drama school, <clears throat> um, but somehow art school was just about acceptable. Um, and I thought, well, I got a really good grade at art. Let's go to art school. So I went to art school and I have no idea why I went. And within a very short period of time, I was thinking, why am I here? I don't feel as if I fit in, I don't know what the point is. Um, I don't want to go to the pub actually every lunchtime and be all kind of weird, which is strange because I was only young and I wasn't a killjoy. So I don't know what that was about, but I didn't feel right. So I literally one day decided that's it. 
I'm not doing this anymore. I was like about three months into a foundation course. And so I, that I, I decided I was going to just quit. And I went to the local job center and the first job that was available was for a sales assistant in in mother care actually which had just started back in those days and so i i i quit art school and become a sales assistant and this was nothing to do with some great big career choice it was to do with please let me do something off my own bat that i just am proactively doing and I can earn a bit of money, I can begin to feel more independent, and I don't care if it hasn't got a grand purpose. So that was great. Summer of 1976, actually, I remember it well, because it was very hot and we had nylon uniforms um, and no air conditioning. So I do remember that. But what I remember most is a few months into this, my father, bless him, decides this isn't good enough for his daughter. <laughs> who he spent a fortune on educating. So he introduces me to somebody to do with retailing, some high up person. And the next thing I know, I've been accepted onto a management training course at Harrods. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> so, so I'm now once more not doing something that I had planned to do. And that pattern actually continued. You could say I could have just said, no, I don't want to do it. But, you know, I don't know. That's not so easy at 18 or whatever it was. And I did like the idea of going to London. Um, yeah. I didn't like the thing. I never fitted in. And so, again, I sort of rebelled and ended up walking away from that after about 18 months. But, but lo and behold, my father then got me a job in an advertising agency. <laughs> And I thought, oh, I suppose that could be quite glamorous, quite fun. And again, I didn't fit in. I didn't know why I was there. So after a period of time, of course, I rebelled again and ran off. And then I did something crazy, doing market stalls in London, selling antiques, knew nothing about them, um, went out with some fabulous Italian guy, lived in squalor somewhere in El I was, I was in that pattern and that to answer your question in a long way, was me sort of registering that I was not going to be told what to do. I, I, I needed to find this somehow myself and I didn't have a plan. Um, the only thing I'd ever thought about was going to drama school. That's easier said than done anyway. Um, but I, I guess I just thought if I keep just exploring, then life's adventure will unravel and we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose around about that age, and when I was about 20, I, I knew that I had to keep fighting to get out of various cages that either I or someone else had put me in. Um, but equally, I didn't have a sense of who I was, really. I, I just knew that what I wasn't. Yes, because probably uh, you spent, uh, you know, the childhood and uh, coming into adulthood, uh, you spend that time listening to what others told you that you should be. So yeah. basically, it was a back and forth between what other people want for you and what other people think that is fitting, befitting you, <laughs> and uh, you wanted to wanting to make your own choices wanted to wanting to be on your own and figuring figuring yourself out figuring things out and it's interesting because i think that people usually start asking questions when um and taking action because usually when you start asking a question uh, there's an action that follows i think that this is when the the pain they are in is greater than the pain of uh, that any change would bring along and i don't mean pain as in uh, physical pain it's you know the pain of not not knowing who you are and not being in touch with yourself and i know that you had to let go of various things along the way even the story that you told yourself about you the, the story that was somebody else's 
And I know that letting go of, of things is hard, uh, even the things that are toxic to you, because they become so much a part of you that you can't tell where you end and they begin. And <laughs> there was a time... Uh, there was a time that I used to uh, to say that everything I ever let go of has claw marks on it. This is how tight I was holding on to things, even things that, as I mentioned, were not good for me, were not, <laughs> they were toxic for me. And I, uh, I didn't, if, uh, I mean, if you don't let go, sometimes you tend to forget who you are. And you tend to uh, to identify to that story, the story that you are telling yourself. What did you have to let go along the way? The things that weren't good for you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, my goodness. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so obviously, part of the story, I mean, we could all talk about old careers and jobs, and I had this plan and I had this work and I did I did all sorts of things but nobody human can put out of the picture human relationships you know so blokes basically chaps men um were very much part of this story and of course I was living out um a sort of a, a very a, a very unhealthy way of wanting to be wanted basically which was you know whatever we can all get on the psycho psychiatrist couch on that one but i was because i hadn't really figured myself out all i could do was try and be what i thought other people would want me to be so that applied to my boyfriends if you could even call them that <laughs> these sort of scattered relationships here and there um but then it but then that did become a serious relationship which ended in in marriage and um because i had gone into it without in any way figuring out what the heck i was about i rather got pulled in by somebody who probably had some similarities to my father <laughs> shall we say he was actually older than me as well by about 14 years um it was the absolute classic story i was his secretary oh my goodness what a cliche um but he was very charismatic intelligent and he clearly recognized a certain vulnerability in me as well as a sort of um excitement if you like because you know i wasn't a, you know i was i wasn't a wallflower shall we say but but he he played on all of that and unbeknown to me and something i only learned in hindsight really was that he was an out and out narcissist of you know serious proportions uh, he could be absolutely charming and wonderful but he fundamentally what's called gaslighted me for a number of years and yeah there was some pretty not good stuff going on but i had two kids um so i did know that it i had to get out um and so I had, I, what I think of is that I had held on to enough of me to be able to propel myself through what was a really difficult thing, which was leaving this person. And anyone who's ever been in any kind of relationship like this will know it's all very well for outsiders to say, well, of course you had to leave him, blah, blah, blah. He was doing all these awful things, blah, blah, blah. but it's just not as simple as that. And so I, I did, I did, step out um and i guess then had to deal with the ramifications of that which were me feeling like i was nothing because at that because weirdly what you said you know you become part of that story that that part of me that was kind of beholden to this massive charisma thing um and felt like my life was maybe exciting because there was certainly drama involved in it um was now nothing you know and and i was back in a sort of i, I actually went to live with my parents because i had two little kids so what i was was a mother there's no question about that i was definitely a mother but i was 
from the other perspective of me, I was nothing. I, I just felt that I was now sort of almost just a, a kind of blob of meaningless um, existence, which is ridiculous because I'd actually escaped and was about to go on a much better journey, but couldn't see it then. So what you just said about when you when you have to let go of something, it's it, it's really painful and you're all over the shop. But but ultimately, it, it was a good thing, obviously. <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult because uh, this is what happens when you you derive your sense of ident your identity from someone else's story about yourself and that story is all, always uh just a narrow uh way of you know uh being looked at being i mean and Yes, these type of uh, these type of people, the narcissists, the dominant uh, characters, personalities, they always try to put the other one down. <laughs> you know, this is uh, yeah, but that's uh, that's a different <laughs> different story. That's a whole story. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. I, I've certainly had plenty of that. Um, yes, unfortunately, my my mother was rather good at that as well. Um, <laughs> but but. Yeah, the story moves on, and that's the good part of it. Is the story moves on and evolves, and and I keep exploring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I know that it can be really hard uh, figuring out your next step when when things get overwhelming. And yes, you you do need you do need a support in that particular time. And uh, I know it's it's scary, but it's also freeing. Uh, I, I recently saw a, a documentary about uh, about spider monkeys. Um, they're flying through the through the jungle from vine to vine, and they are incredible because there's always this moment after they let go of the previous vine, <laughs> the vine before before they grab on to to the next one, and they don't falter. They don't look down. They just go on faith knowing that the next vine is going to be there did you also go on faith knowing that uh, that your thing what you were meant to do who you were meant to be must be somewhere and it you must need be to somewhere figure it out where it is <laughs> somewhere. yes um it's interesting because at that point i re took up something that had been a really special part of my life earlier on, which was the acting. But because weirdly, I had dropped it completely for, for a period of time from going to London to leaving my first husband, no, nothing, no acting. And I took it up, apart from anything else, I knew I had to make friends because I'd moved to a completely different place, a little, a little town, um, living with my parents. This wasn't ideal with two little kids, a uh, single mother sort of thing. Um, but anyway, I found, I found that part of me again, and also found friends, which as you say, was, was the support network. Um, and, and just getting back in touch with that little, little chunky gold nuggets that was inside me again, um, which, had, which, had, which had been really precious earlier on as I was growing up uh, as a kid and in my teens. It had been the one place when I was acting that I felt more alive and actually more, more me, which sounds counterintuitive when you're acting, but there we go, that's another episode. Um, so I, I got I, I held on to that nice little nugget again and that did I think give give me some sense of well that that is the me in there that that part of me it, it still exists nobody's nobody's taken that away um and not only does it exist it needs to be it needs to be nurtured and I then was fortunate enough on top of that to meet um a very nice man. Um, now you could say maybe I should have had a long period without any men <laughs> to have got myself together. Um, Ooh, but yeah. hey, <laughs> uh, you know, that's all very idealistic. But I was very lucky. I met a very nice chap who's actually um, the father of my third child. We are not together still. But he is a friend. And he was a very 
important part of, of the journey I went on. I mean, it has to be said, I clearly wasn't obviously immediately cured because I was still having to work everything out. But yeah. but I could have so easily gone back into another similar relationship. So I'm very pleased that that step was forward into a better place. And then I did more. He was very supportive in terms of me doing more performance work. And then that really developed. And then I started creating one woman shows, one woman plays. I became a professional and that definitely was my, uh, I would say that was quite a lifesaver actually, to be honest. Um, not because I was hiding behind playing parts, but because I was, I was just, every time I worked on something like that, it wasn't just the acting, it was the research, the creative process, the rehearsal. It was the whole thing that I, fully aligned in I was in flow mode I was trusting myself I felt like I was doing something well you know and nobody could take that away from me trust me you know there were still certain members of my family that would have liked to have taken that away from me but I stood my ground on that one <laughs> so uh, you might say that act acting was also a, a refuge for you and also a beautiful and artistic way and creative way to uh, gain confidence and to get to know yourself would would that be yes. accurate yes absolutely yes yes and it's funny because people maybe who haven't experienced acting um might think it's about you know people who want to get up on a stage and have everyone look at them and show off a bit and it and it it, it's so not that it's so not that it's it's yeah. I mean my husband is a rock climber my my current husband ladies and gentlemen who I've been um who I've known for 15 years and is absolutely delightful um he's a rock climber and he also you know that when he's rock climbing he is in the moment it's in flow, as we call it, you know, you're not worrying about anything else and all the complicated questions about life and the universe, because you have to take one step after another. And that's a really, so it's, it's so acting is similar to many other things that some of your listeners might do where they have that sense of being present. And it's, I think, a crucial um, part of remaining sane <laughs> in this crazy world. Yeah. Yes, for for me, it's uh, it's making art when I paint or uh, whatever. I work with glass. I work with wood sometimes. Well, I didn't get the chance to do as much as I used to. Uh, but yes, it's like uh, it's like a meditation to me at that point. I totally, you know, I'm focusing on what I'm doing, and uh, my mind doesn't get to, doesn't get to wander anymore to you know to the problems to the whatever. <laughs> And yes, it's uh, it's uh, it's an interesting process. Uh, it, it's a, it's a therapeutic process as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about act acting. Uh, would you say that somehow maybe also borrowed from uh, from the characters that you were um, you know personifying? Did you borrow a few traits from there? You know, when you needed <laughs> bits and pieces. Maybe to see if that, you recognize yeah, yourself that's, in them. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting thing to think about um, because it. <laughs> I was aware that it can be. Um, I was aware of my the way I am, which is the way I am. Okay, so it's not like th this was me being me, and I I knew that I immersed myself quite a lot into these characters. So there is a danger in that, because if the character is a certain way, then you don't actually want to live that out for weeks on yeah. end. So, I mean, I did some very serious Ibsen in a fringe theatre up in London. For three weeks, I was away from home doing this very quite dark part, and I'm not sure that did me much good. So in a way, that was another self-awareness kind of kick, um, knowing that I had to make this work for me and that if I wasn't careful, you know, I would be falling in love with every leading man, you know, if that was my role, I would, you know, because I'm just so kind of raw and open mm -hmm. to the 
to the process and experience. So just being really honest, that that is the case. And anyone out there who's been involved in acting will understand what I mean. So I I took some proactive control, which which in and of itself was really good for my growing experience. So back to where we started, you know, in terms of not doing, you know, so the conventional would have been, I should have, so I, I turned professional, I should have been auditioning for stuff, you know, uh, up in London, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I thought, no, I now have another small child. I need to make this work in a practical way and I need to work, make it work in my mental state way as well. So I, that was when I started producing my own uh, pieces of performance, either plays or shows or um, sort of almost speaking pieces and organizing those little tours. I even did stuff in schools as well. So it was um, in that respect, I, I, I found that, yeah, I was growing in terms of the sense of I now am making this work for me. I'm not doing what everybody says I should do as an actor. Um, and, uh, you know, that that just, uh, my identity wasn't so sort of segmented because, yeah, I was a, I was a mom and, you know, human and everything and um, as, as well as an actor. If that, I'm, I rambled there, but I think, I think I made some sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what i what i love about your story is the fact that um you searched and searched for yourself and finally you managed to you know to call back all the different bits and pieces of yourself that were scattered <laughs> that uh, uh, i don't know detached themselves because uh, because of other people because of life experiences but finally you managed to uh as I said at the beginning, to come into your own and to um, to confidently talk about your skills, your talents, your qualities. Um, but still, probably, you know, when you start doing it, you actually start doing it and uh, talking uh, to people and writing about these things. There's always, you know, that voice in your head, that parental voice in your head saying, uh, you actually mentioned this uh, at the beginning, uh, keep your head down. It's not nice to brag. Stop showing off. <laughs> so what was, yes. it, uh, what was it like for you when you first um, acknowledged yourself and started talking about what you do after figuring out that it was meant for you and that this is your path? How do you it, how do you manage it, that <laughs> that voice? It's such a yeah, it's such a subtle thing. This it's so there's so much there's, there's so many layers to this. It's it's I, I, I say it's fascinating not because I'm talking about myself, listeners, but because as on a human basis, we we will all be um, you know fighting with all these various layers. So. And it's a question of stopping the fight, basically, and so everything sort of slightly relaxes and thing. And that's what it felt like when I got to this place. It was a, a, absolutely like having a weight taken off my shoulder, mind, stomach, body. I, I don't mean stomach as in losing weight. I mean that knot in your stomach. Um, and I, it's, the funny thing was that although I had carved out this really good. Um, acting and acting related sort of portfolio career i suppose part of me despite getting all the really good feedback lovely lovely things said i still didn't quite i still didn't quite own it as i should have done and i became very conscious of this and it was like i was wanting to walk away as quickly as possible after performing Although people were saying lovely things, I kind of still had this weird idea that I'd be, it, this is a classic imposter syndrome thing. I'll be found out any minute now. Any minute now, they'll realize I've completely conned them. It wasn't that good. Um, and they'll be really embarrassed that they've said all these nice things. Um, so I must get out into my car as quickly as possible, get round the corner, get out of sight. And I literally thought like that. So I became aware that although like a swan gliding 
everything was really lovely and I was doing all this stuff really well and I knew I was doing it well. So this is the thing with imposter syndrome. It, I didn't think that I was a fraud, actually. I knew that what I did was really good. But there's a difference between that and somehow then valuing it properly. So it's almost like, yeah, all right, so I do that really well, um, but that doesn't make me much of a success, does it? which is just weird but it happens i was once i think it was my husband actually once said but you know you don't i was talking about money and he at the time was earning a lot of money as a consultant and he's not a money kind of motivated guy but it was just the going rate for what he was doing and i was earning a small amount of money working doing the speaker engagements in community sort of settings and also working with people with dementia doing reminiscence work which was glorious but none of these things pay much money and he said look just just think of it as this i'm being overpaid you're being underpaid you know <laughs> for the value balance. you give yeah There's it's a a simple, yeah it's, it's just the way the world works he was trying to get me to really understand that i was giving value and what I did, I did really well, but it was really, you know, it was special and I shouldn't judge it against the, the, the money as much as perhaps I was. However, there was still another missing part. Why was I not, why was I feeling that I was on what I call survive mode rather than thrive? So I do all this stuff and then I'd come back at the end of the day. Maybe it's the introvert in me because despite being an actor, I've got quite a lot of introvert stuff about me as well and it was almost like oh i'm exhausted you know i just i just have to be in this space on my own and i oh phew i've got away with another day you know and i thought this isn't right you know i'm nearly 60 come on get a grip what is going on and it was at that point that i decided the only way now was to step out of that beautiful comfort zone and go into something utterly crazy, set up my own business, slay the demons that have been laid down by my father all those years ago that you couldn't be in business without being a cold, you know, sort of person and, um, and, and shake everything up again. <laughs> because it was like, it's like a little sort of, um, like a little, I don't want to say spot. I did actually say to I was talking to you earlier and talked about a boil that you lance. It's like it can remain, something can remain there, even though life goes on perfectly well. It's just a little thing. We'll forget about it. Um, but actually, what if it starts, what if it grows? And what if what if you know, you know, and and you've got to go through that pain again just to get rid of that last little bit. And that's what I did, and that's what I've done. And four years later, I'm happy to say I really, really feel very um aligned with with me that doesn't mean to say i don't have days where i slip into these odd little traps that we all do but yeah i'm very aware of them now so i'm i'm equipped to fight back fairly quickly <laughs> Um, it's funny because um, I just saw a post on LinkedIn this morning um, about the imposter syndrome and somebody said something like uh, along the lines of uh, we should lend this imposter syndrome to uh, people in uh, positions of power that don't belong there, you know, <laughs> so they can get a taste of this. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a thing called, um, it was done by two researchers, Dunning and Kruber um and so it's called the sort of dunning kruber effect and it's it's the opposite you know in very simplistic terms it's like the opposite of imposter people who are just going around completely deluded thinking that they're great <laughs> yeah and they're not <laughs> which must be bliss in a way um fantastic but yeah i think i think the hard work is worth it okay i'd rather i'd rather be going through this hard work than be deluded and not asking all those questions yeah yeah um you know i've, I've heard that uh, i've heard some people say that uh, pressure pressure is a privilege but i don't think it is i mean being under pressure to perform to be somebody to achieve this to get that what is your take on this how do you 
Ooh, that's that's really interesting because it's a sort of there are two meanings of the word. I mean, I I do love a deadline. I like I, I like a deadline. I I remember the first time I wrote that one woman play that the first thing I toured. Um, I booked I booked half the venues before I'd even started writing the play. So I I'm quite keen on deadlines, but that's not that's not what we're talking about. Pressure from um, outside sort of. Um, messages of uh success and you know achieve this by this by this in this amount of time um you know get rich quick whatever whatever um feel the fear and do it i mean that you know i agree with elements of feel the fear and do it but not not with the big pressure thing because all of this stuff is step by step it's drip drip okay mm, nothing bad happened let's push that a little bit more but it has to come you, you you have to take the brave steps you, you have to trust in yourself to take those brave steps if it's pushed on you from outside you'll you'll never really own even if you take the brave step you don't own it wherever you get to yeah so i see an interesting poster behind you on the wall <laughs> the mystery of the squashed self so please tell us a few oh, words I, about I forgot them. I, I forgot it was on the wall <laughs> yeah <laughs> so please share with us uh, something oh, I'm, about i'm the, very the excited book. about this it's probably i don't know by the time people hear this it, it's it's kind of there on amazon um uh, official publication at, is april the 1st but it's um it's it's pretty much there the ebooks there and it's a year since i started the concept of writing a book which apparently is not bad going um but i worked with a team and that's a very good message anyone thinking of writing a book you start with a book coach um and uh, you know involve other people so so i feel that i'm very proud of it you know it's been properly put together designed and edited and it's it looks good and the content just is has got me all over it um but not in a it's not my life story but obviously everything we've just discussed goes into it but that is also everything in the four years that i've learned from my clients and from all the conversations um all the feedback i've had on the content and everything i've posted so it's not just me that recognized that there was this you know this squashed self as we've really covered in this discussion and when you're when you're doing everything with this squashed self mode um with the squashed self in charge basically you are going to fall into all the self-sabotaging traps that are set for us because they are all over the shop you know the um the comparisonitis the people pleasing the dumbing down because you're afraid of showing off the not being funny because you think it might not be professional the you know identity crisis am i a mother am i a businesswoman oh god i can't be both you know because society says i can't and on we go so in this book i decided very bravely with the encouragement of my book coach to take my character investigator lewis who had been born uh, about a year ago and there on LinkedIn um, and really use that character and story to propel the, the message. And so eight small business owners, all with their own frustrations, go to visit Investigator Lewis, who's like a old school private eye, you know, and Sherlock Holmes. describe <laughs> the, their story. Um, and investigator has a notepad you know ask relevant questions here and there but it's basically the story and then the investigator goes to see her colleague professor p and this was my way then of retaining that storytelling fun but then getting the research the science the psychology in as well behind the behaviors that drive the behaviors so professor p performs that role and then investigator Lewis goes back and writes up her recommendations, her report. So in a way that, of course, is now, you know, advice, tips. And in fact, each segment finishes with a crack your own case, which is a, a an exercise to do very much, you know, pulling it back to your specific um, business or, you know, growth journey. So and then it's topped and tailed that sort of sets it up and 
talks about fear of rejection and, and all of that stuff. Lots of lovely references in it. It's action focused, but it's fun because I, I think bringing something to life, making it very real, which is what I do with my clients when I do role play and stuff like that with them is a great way of, of learning. And also we all need to be able to laugh at ourselves as well. That's, that's kind of important. So yeah, this is it, my first book, and I'm already thinking about my second. So clearly I've not been put off by the exhausting process of getting a book out there, but yeah, it's, it's exciting. I'm very happy for you. Thank you very much, Trisha. When, uh, you know, when I first uh, heard your story, uh, the image of the caterpillar turning into, into a butterfly came to my mind. You know, the, the struggle that the caterpillar goes through in order to, you know, uh, get out of the cocoon and becoming mm. a beautiful butterfly. And this is how I see you right now. <laughs> beautiful butterfly. Thank you. And and just to remind everybody, I'm I'm 64 in August. I'm I'm 63. <laughs> so that's, I just say that because never too late, you know. Yes, yes. I have uh, one last question for you. Uh, I'm curious if you were to to build yourself a tool for your uh, coaching toolbox or for your life toolbox, what would that tool be? Wow. Um, okay. So. I mean, obviously I do use some tools. Um, I have a thing called, this is really simple. It's, it, but I, I'm quite keen on visualization. So um, I've, I've just cr created this visual of a, what I call the unsquasher map. And it's, if anyone remembers playing snakes and ladders when they were a kid, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's based on that. So you start off and you, you are going to go on a journey that's your life that's your business that's all of that stuff and you're going to have snakes along the way of course you are you're going to have all these little squasher traps as i call them which you might just slip down and go back to square one so what you need is the ladders to take you over those traps or at least go around them somehow not fall down the snake so this is a self-awareness game you you have to list your ladders, which are your your power unsquashers, the stuff that you know you've got within you that that gives you that propelling, lovely sense of I can do this. Identify those and identify your squasher, um, your squashers, which are all those triggers that we all know. There are certain things that will have us falling right down those rabbit holes or the snakes, I'm, I'm mixing my animals now, um, <laughs> rabbit holes with snakes in, I don't know. <laughs> but we know, we know whether it's a person, people, whether it's a situation, whether it's a word, you know, there are certain triggers. So actually write them down, write your list of your ladders and which are, the, which are gonna take you across this, all these little danger zones, the snakes. Yes, thank you very much, Trisha. <laughs> I will, uh, I will leave my listeners with one final note. Get to where you want to be, one story at a time. Thank you, Trisha. It's a pleasure. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the emails so you can be notified when the next videos are uploaded. You can find all the necessary details in the description below.